Zach with Wingard Wearables. You're one of 12 special people who's going to watch this video to the end. In today's video, I'm going to be reading from an historic account of desperate violence on America's frontier. Now, uh, I've been researching everything I can about historic tomahawks, anything I can that can gain insight into how these were used, design features, combative techniques. Unfortunately, uh, you know, with the tribes on the eastern woodlands in the time when the tomahawk was most prevalent as a weapon in the battle, um, those combative techniques, you know, their history was an oral history, and that oral history, it's long gone. There's no known credible accounts today where we can, you know, for certainty say, you know, this was a combative technique used with these particular tomahawks. So it's important to look at the historic accounts to gain any insight you can into how these weapons were used. And as I was doing this sort of research, I came across a historic account that I just had to share with you guys because it provides a lot of insight into the weapons that were used on America's frontier and the limitations and their capabilities. Now, I'll be looking downward quite a bit as I read this account for you. Um, but um, this account comes from two sources. First is called, the book is called Sketches of Border Adventures in the Life and Times of Major Moses Van Campen. Um, and this was published in 1842. Um, and the other book is called The History of, I'm going to mispronounce this, Schoharie County and the Border Wars of New York. And this is by... Uh, Jephthah Root Sims, published in 1845. And both these accounts being written in the 1840s, they include 19th century language. Um, even though they're written by two authors in two different time periods, uh, it's the story about an incident, a terrible incident, happened to Moses Van Campen, who was a soldier during the Revolutionary War. Uh, he was actually alive into the 1840s and gave this account. So this is the first uh, person account, first-hand account, um, you know, and so I'm going to choose of the two books, the accounts differ very little, even though they're two different authors published in different years. I'm choosing the book, uh, the account that is written more exciting, you know, for 19th century language, so uh, I'm going to be reading from you, but, um, you know, one of the quotes, Moses Van Campen as a soldier uh, serving on the frontier uh, one of his more famous quotes was, quote, I was nurtured in the school of the rifle and the tomahawk. Uh, he really, from a youth, grew up with, uh, you know, frontiersmen and Native Americans learning to hunt, learning to fight with the, uh, the rifle, the tomahawk, and the long knife. And you're going to see all of that in this account here. Now, to give a little bit of context on this, uh, Moses, Moses Van Campen, he was a soldier in the American Revolutionary War, uh, serving on the New York frontier, and uh, primarily attempting to defend settlements uh, against uh, Loyalist and Native American allies of the British that were doing all sorts of raids and incursions. Um, and also, you know, he was on the offensive as well. Um, he lived until 1849, so he was alive during the writings of these books. Uh, and this is the reason why these historic accounts are so very detailed. Now, Moses Van Campen served as a quartermaster in charge of gathering supplies for the Sullivan Expedition back in 1779. Uh, this was a scorched earth campaign against uh, Native American tribes of the Iroquois Confederacy that had allied with the British uh, or uh, provided shelter for British allied tribes. Uh, this is kind of like uh, in, from the Civil War era, Sherman's March to the Sea, uh, but, you know, at a fraction of the population and infrastructure. So although the Sullivan campaign was much smaller in scope uh, and in scale, its destruction was very thorough. Uh, obviously, the warriors who were, uh, you know, had their lands burned and their people left starving, uh, they wanted their territory back uh, and they wanted payback. And in 1780, they would get it. So Moses Van Campen was in a cabin with his father and younger brother. 
when it was attacked by 10 Seneca warriors. So this is the quote, the father of Moses Van Campen was thrust through with a spear and whilst the red warrior was with his foot on the breast of his victim endeavoring to extricate his spear, another savage had dashed out the brains of Moses Van Campen's brother with a tomahawk and was aiming a blow at Moses's head. He seized the Indian's arm and arresting the descending blow. Whilst thus engaged, his father's murderer thrust his spear at his side, but he avoided the weapon, being only slightly wounded. At this moment, the chief, who I believe the chief, the leader of the war party was named John Mohawk, interfered and his life was spared. After several days' march, the party of Seneca's above mentioned arrived near Tioga Point, and Major Van Campen, he was a lieutenant at the time, along with a Dutchman by the name of Pence, another man who's named Pike, a robust Yankee, and two small children. During the day, these prisoners marched with the party, bearing the baggage, and at the evening halt were made to carry the wood for the fires. So in those just first two paragraphs of this historic account, um, you know, there's several things that I think are noteworthy. First, you note the use of the spear. This was most likely a metal-headed spear. Uh, spears do occasionally come up uh, in the historic accounts of 18th century frontier warfare, but they're relatively rare. It's only a couple of times in all the accounts I've seen where that's come up. Historically, stone-tipped spears um, you know, they had a fairly fragile point, a, a stone-napped head. Uh, so they were not really an instrument of warfare in the Northeast woodlands. You know, it was more, um, you know, their traditional weapons of bow and arrow, some uh, thrown maybe javelin-type weapons, but um, mostly it was, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat with to uh, war clubs and later with tomahawks. Uh, but here the spear is used and it works, but note it had an extraction issue. Um, now, also note that Moses, before getting tomahawk, seized the warrior's arm. Uh, this is only uh, one of a couple of accounts where a tomahawk chop was hindered by either grabbing the arm or grabbing um, the, the tomahawk to get into grappling. It's obviously it's difficult to do, and Van Campen was uh, hopelessly outnumbered. Uh, but the fact is, if you're facing a weapon like a tomahawk or a mace or a club, you had this narrow band of lethality at maximum reach, sort of a lethal chopping arc, and your best chance is either to stay well out of range of the chopping arc or to get inside that arc into grappling range, which is what he did to arrest the swinging blow uh, because he was essentially unarmed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the tomahawk, it's a, you know, spike tomahawk in particular is a more versatile weapon than, say, a plain hat hatchet-style tomahawk. You know, if the wielder really knows what they're doing with a spike tomahawk and you go into grappling range, they can do lots of nasty techniques uh, to kind of meat hook the spike into you, tear you to ground. But in this account, it was over for him very quickly. He was uh, captured. Um, now, one of the questions, you know, when I read this, because so many of these accounts, you know, involve everyone getting slaughtered, basically. Uh, why did the chief stop his warrior for, from killing Van Campen. Um, so, you know, in reading some of these accounts, you may be wondering, like, well, why was he spared? You know, it was in the heat of battle, you know, could let the warrior finish him off easy. Um, really, it was common at the time for war parties to favor taking captives instead of taking scalps. Uh, captives could be forced into labor. Um, to reduce the war party's burdens. And in this case, you see that, you know, they were made to carry the baggage and also lug around the firewood for fire uh, making, you know, at the end of the day. Um, so if a raid resulted in seizing valuable goods, which was often happened, the captives could be forced to carry them back on the long journey back on foot um, to friendly territory. And there are also accounts of some captives being sold uh, as prisoners to colonial powers who would use them in prisoner exchanges too. So a captive had a lot of material worth and value. Um, and you have other accounts of younger captives being adopted into tribes. So here in this account, there were two young boys that were also captured. So, you know, who knows what the intent was with them as captives, but 
you know, clearly they decided it was worth the trouble to take these uh, you know, prisoners as captive instead of just bringing back scalps. Um, but unfortunately for this war party, as we will see, the captives would be far too much trouble. So the account continues. Quote, Van Campen had for some time urged upon the two men, prisoners with him, to make an attempt to escape during the night by tomahawking the Indians whilst sleeping. He depicted to them the horrors of long captivity and of the agonizing tortures with which they would probably be subjected. Now, to give some context, he was the quartermaster on the Sullivan campaign that committed atrocities to, you know, these warriors' native lands. So they're going to be, you know, these are some of the earliest prisoners that have captured after that brutal campaign. Um, so, yeah, you know, Moses Van Campen was, felt pretty certain their fate was pretty bad unless they did something. It was sort of a, you're going to get killed if you get taken back to their friendly territory, or you risk, you know, trying to escape. And this escape, escape is very, a very desperate attempt. And his companions, you know, there's essentially three of them against ten warriors. Uh, they were at first very alarmed at the danger of the contest with ten warriors. And during the afternoon preceding the eventful night of their delivery, they do escape, he succeeded in persuading them to join him in the meditated blow. There's that 19th century language for you. Before they crossed the river and their retreat was thereby cut off, he advised them to remove the Indians' rifles and with the heads of the tomahawks dash out their brains. For if the edges of the weapons were used, the time required to extricate the hatchet after each blow would prove a dangerous delay. He was overruled by his comrades and after some discussion with them, that plan was adopted, which was finally acted upon. Very difficult language for me to read. I'm public school educated in Alabama. But uh, this, you know, is interesting to me because I have tested tomahawks to simulate the challenges of uh, chopping into flesh and bone and rapidly extracting from flesh and bone. Now, there are a lot of tomahawk designs uh, on the market today and some historic designs that definitely have some extraction issues. So if you see this one here, just looking at the hatchet type blade, how bearded it is. Uh, that can, when it's plunged into flesh and bone, get sort of hung up and have a, a little momentary delay or lag to extract it, sometimes even requiring a second hand to pull it out. Um, and it's clear from, you know, some of the accounts that Van Campen's experience with Tom Ox were more of the hatchet-like variety. Um, but there are other Tom Ox designs, historic Tom Ox, that really don't have that extraction issue. So for example, this spontoon tomahawk has is essentially a flattened spike with no edges here. Many people think this was a dagger-like blade, but it wasn't. And we have tested this, you know, into uh, flesh and bone surrogate. Um, and, you know, it, you know, we test this against like melons. Melons tend to exaggerate extraction issues and it pops right out. Um, so, you know, designs like this don't necessarily have a problem with extraction. Um, now, the tomahawk Van Campen would wind up using in his escape happened to be a spontoon pipe tomahawk similar looking to this one. And I'll show a picture of it that's uh, featured in a museum here. Um, but there are accounts of the pipe side of pipe tomahawks being used as the impact weapon. Um, so in this historic account, it says he advised using the heads of the tomahawk instead of the edge. I think he was probably referring to using the back end of the tomahawk, whether it was a pipe side or a plain uh, hammer pole type tomahawk instead of the blade. Um, it's also doubtful that Van Campen prior to this had experience using spontoon tomahawks as weapons. From all the accounts I've surveyed, spontoon tomahawks like this one were not carried by frontiersmen. They really don't have uh, any utility purpose. This blade is not sharpened and is not a shape of blade that is terribly useful for gathering firewood or butchering game. Um, so from all the accounts I've surveyed, frontiersmen favored the more hatchet style uh, tomahawk blades. Um, so he may have believed 
the, the tomahawk he would later seize would wind up causing extraction issues. So, going back to the account. At the evening, the savages, according to their custom, lighted their fires and bound the arms of the captives behind their backs. They then cut two forked stakes uh, for each side of the fire and placed between them, resting on the forks, two poles against which they could lean their rifles. During the evening meal, one of the savages, after sharpening a stick on which to roast his meat, laid down his knife in the grass near the feet of Van Campen, who saw it and so turned his feet as to cover it, hoping the Indian would forget it before going to rest. After the meal as finished was finished, the ten Indians, having first examined their prisoners to ascertain if they were fast bound, then laid down asleep. Five were on each side of the fire, their heads under the poles, his rifle standing at the head of each, ready to be grasped in an instant. Um, and I have a, a sketch here of what I think that layout looks like here. Um, but it does provide some insight into the war party's preparations. They really do seem to have a good layout for you know, going to sleep, but being able to immediately wake up and access their rifles. Unfortunately for the Seneca, it, a couple of things got sloppy here. One of the warriors misplaced the knife, and that would lead to their undoing. Now, we go back to the account. Around About midnight, Van Campen sat up and looked around to learn if all were asleep. Their loud snoring told him the hour to strike had arrived. He then, with his feet, drew the knife within reach of his pinioned hands. Rising cautiously, he roused his companions. Pence cut the bands from Van Campen's arms. So Pence is the Dutchman. And the latter then loosed his two comrades. There had been a slight fall of snow, which had frozen among the leaves and rendered every footstep fearfully audible but they succeeded in removing all the rifles to a tree a short distance from the fire without awakening the warriors. During the afternoon, several of the rifles had been discharged in killing a deer and through forgetfulness left unloaded. So a little bit of sloppiness there on the Seneca there. Uh, the plan proposed was that Pence, the Dutchman, who was an excellent marksman, should lie down on the left of one row of Indians and have three rifles next to him and at the signal, fire. They supposed the same ball would pass through at least two of the savages. In the meantime, Van Campen would tomahawk three of those on the other side, and Pike, the uh, stout Yankee, would tomahawk two. Then there would be but three Indians remaining, and there would be three captives fighting them, so they were to, each was to fasten to his foe, Van Campen and Pike with their tomahawks, and Pence with one of the undischarged rifles. So this is a desperate plan. Pence thinks he has two functional rifles. Uh, Van Campen has a tomahawk. Turns out it's, it's this tomahawk, a spontoon-style pipe tomahawk. Pike has a tomahawk, uh, and yeah, you're going to see how well this plan worked out. Uh, now, uh, this and other historic accounts have shown that Native American warriors and frontiersmen were, were well aware of their weapons capabilities and limitations. Um, so I just want to point out Van Campen, uh, being a little sneaky, was able to steal a knife, which he used you know, to cut ropes. So he already had a weapon, um, yet he chose not to use the knife as a weapon. Instead, he risked stealing two tomahawks to make sure each blow from himself and Pike were effective. You'll see that in this area and time period, uh, the tomahawk was always favored over the knife. A tomahawk has maximum lethality at maximum reach. Uh, it has enough power to reliably blast through flesh and bone. Uh, bury blades into brains. Knives, especially of this era, were thin rat tail tangs, sometimes not even all the way through the handle, only partially inserted into a wooden handle. Um, they're fine for stabs and slashes against flesh, um, and there are accounts of warriors transitioning from throwing a tomahawk to the long knife to finish an opponent, um, but these weapons could not be reliably counted upon to stab into the central nervous system, to stab someone in the brain. Um, 
and here you got two men with tomahawks that are supposed to wipe out five or more warriors in their sleep. They needed, uh, you know, the tomahawk because it would, could be instantly effective if the chop came down in the right location. Uh, knives seek flesh, not bone. The tomahawk is indifferent and will reliably bury through flesh or bone. Um, it was also known at this time, and this is something that, you know, if you don't know a lot about the terminal ballistics of the era, you might think lead round balls, like the musket balls that they used, um, that they wouldn't be that good of a penetrating projectile. But it was actually known that a single musket ball could pass through multiple men. Uh, so the kinetic energy of the muzzle-loading rifles and muskets of that era were on the order of 3,000 to 4,000 joules of muzzle energy. It's similar to the muzzle energy of a 7.62 NATO cartridge, but instead of a small diameter lightweight Spitzer bullet, it was firing a big heavy lead alloy sphere. Um, and if you know anything about terminal ballistics, modern rifle ballistics, uh, you know, a Spitzer bullet, it's spin stabilized in flight, but when it, it becomes unstable, when it hits tissues, it tumbles and swerves off the shot line, sometimes it'll fragment. So you get lots of kinetic energy loss within the first, say, 12 inches or so of penetration depth. But a dense lead round ball that's really heavy is just has a tendency to plow straight through, um, remaining stable along the shot line, not depositing a lot of kinetic energy along the way. And you'll see these um, you know, gel ballistic gelatin shots of historic muskets just plow through 18 inches of ballistic gelatin with still plenty of speed. Um, so their plan of using a single shot weapon to perforate multiple opponents, multiple targets, um, they knew that could work. They just didn't know how many one musket ball could go through. Um, and especially if you're talking harder lead alloys, which will have less of a tendency to flatten or deform on impact, uh, you know, if it, a lead round ball continues in its uh, round spherical shape, I mean, there are accounts of, you know, shots going through multiple men at a time and ambushes being laid such that single shot muzzle loaders would take shot lines uh, aimed to pass through multiple men, you know, in the opening volley, taking out two to three opponents at a time. Um, and in fact, seasoned veterans of frontier warfare were advised to walk in a more spread out fashion to reduce the probability of a single shot incapacitating two of the men. Okay, going back to the account. All things being ready, Van Campen's tomahawk dashed out the brains of one of the Indians in a single blow, but Pence's rifle snapped without discharging. At the noise, one of the two Senecas assigned to Pike's charge with a sudden ugh, that's a quote, extended his hand for his rifle. Pike's heart failing him at this awful crisis, he crouched to the ground and stirred not. But Van Campen saw the Indian starting to his feet and as quick as a thought, drove the tomahawk through his head. Just as the fifth blow of Van Campen had dispatched the last savage on his side of the fire, so this is 19th century language, but He's done five blows. He has killed five opponents, all right? Pence then tried the third rifle. So Pence tried the first rifle, didn't work. Tried the second rifle, didn't work. Got to the third rifle. And when he fired it, the ball passed through the heads of four. So that means Pence, in one trigger pull, achieved four headshots in a single shot. Pretty amazing. Uh, the fifth Indian on that side was the leader, John Mohawk, bounded to his feet and rushed towards the rifles. Van Campen darted between him and the tree, and the Mohawk turned in flight. Van Campen pursued him and drove the tomahawk through his shoulder. Mohawk immediately grappled his adversary, and in the struggle, both fell. Van Campen undermost, so he was underneath John Mohawk. Each knew his life depended on the firmness of his grasp, and they clung to each other with unrelated nerve and writhed to break free. Van Campen lay under the wounded shoulder and was almost suffocated with the Indian's blood which streamed over his face. He eagerly stretched his hand 
around the Mohawk's body to reach the knife of the ladder, but the tomahawk had fallen from his hand in the struggle. And in the other book account, this is where it differs a little bit, the blood on his face almost blinded him, and it was Mohawk who had to move his belt so that the knife could stay out of uh, Van Campen's reach. So they're both in a grapple, and neither of them can reach Mohawk's knife. So he either so the tomahawk, Van Campen, the tomahawk he had stolen, uh, had fallen from his hand in the struggle. But as they fell, the Indian's belt had twisted around his body, knife was beyond reach, and at length they break away and both sprint to their feet. Mohawk's arms had been around Van Campen's neck, and the arm of the latter was over the back of the former. So they are just now standing and wrestling. As they grained their feet, Van Campen seized the tomahawk and pursued again the retreating Indian. His first impulse was to hurl the hatchet at his foe, but he saw at once the imprudence of this course. If it missed its object, it would be turned in a moment against his own life, and he therefore gave over the pursuit, and one alone of the ten Senecas escaped. So a lot has happened. Uh, first, Van Campen definitely used the blade side of the tomahawk, and it also doesn't appear the extraction was a problem because he killed five warriors before they could rise up and fight back. Uh, he also did this in just five blows, so that's rapid chops and rapid succession. Um, so it's really no wonder why he picked the tomahawk over the knife. One chop, one kill. Uh, the impact at the right spot instantly incapacitating. Um, now, when you get to the picture of the tomahawk uh, he used, this is now on display at the Letchworth State Park in New York. This is the very tomahawk that Van Campen used. And you can see it is a spontoon tomahawk, but it is different in shape to this one. Uh, but it is very similar. Um, now, over the years, something I've heard people comment when they see a pipe tomahawk on social media or something, you'll have these folks comment that, oh, pipe tomahawks weren't functional weapons. They were fragile, fr fancy accoutrements, strictly for ceremonial status, symbol stuff, and smoking. Um, that is an inaccurate overgeneralization. There are definitely a few examples of historic pipe tomahawks that were likely not functional. So think pewter inlays, poor wood or fancy wood grain geometry that would break under load. Uh, but the majority of pipe tomahawks were very functional. Um, even though there's like a, an eighth inch to a quarter inch diameter hole drilled through the handle um, or burned through the handle, the historic hardwood handles they would use were in straight grain and were significantly thicker than uh, conventional tomahawk handles. So if you look at historic spike tomahawks, often those tomahawk handles would get as thin or thinner than your thumb. And our spike tomahawks are often quite thin to keep it light and fast. You know, on our Empress tomahawk, our Stingray, um, and I have a back ripper on me. We don't have new ones on the site because we sold out, but. You know, when you have a spike tomahawk and its only function of that handle is a strong head handle connection and transmission of load, with hard wood, you can get extraordinarily thin. But with pipe tomahawks, you've drilled a hole in it, which in theory weakens the structure of the handle, so the handles were made substantially thicker. And yes, that does increase the overall weight of a, a pipe tomahawk, uh, but it maintains the strength. Um, so you can, against flesh and bone targets, reliably bury this. And there are accounts of pipe tomahawks being thrown or even being used, you know, not this style, but more the hatchet style in gathering, you know, building shelter or gathering light wood for building a fire. Um, so pipe tomahawks, for the most part, were overbuilt in the handle to maintain strength despite the hollow stem going through it. And they frequently had metal butt caps covering this. And I suspect that was done for structural integrity to prevent the, the wood handle from starting to split. Um, so I think that was like a crack propagation mitigation. That's just a theory of speculation I have. Um, 
but yeah, they were historic pipe tomahawks definitely were weapons of war. Um, and you know, Wingard wearables hopes to offer our own take on that. So you guys can check out a link below about a, a pipe tomahawk that we have in the works, but going back to the story, Pence is supposed to be shooting the warriors, uh, that were asleep, but had multiple ignition failures. And this happened at the worst possible time, right when they started their attack. Um, I've been told that during the uh, Napoleonic Wars of Europe, um, and this is from uh, Brent Gibbons of Paper Cartridges, uh, that, that YouTube channel, he was telling me that the, either the French or the British Army determined that flintlocks would fail to fire in one out of every seven trigger pulls. And here, poor Pence had three rifles loaded, ready to go next to him. And he had to go through two of them before he could get one to fire. So his probability of success just kept getting worse and worse. Uh, this desperate plan went wrong all kinds of ways. Uh, fortunately for him, his aim was true and the terminal ballistics resulted in that single big lead round ball plowing through four warriors' heads. Um, now, another point to make, Moses Van Camp and his instinct was to throw the tomahawk at the fleeing uh, Seneca war leader, John Mohawk. And in his uh, biography, you know, he talks about throwing tomahawks really, really accurately. Uh, but here he holds off. And, uh, you know, a lot of these historic accounts of tomahawks being thrown in combat, it often is a scenario where someone you're trying to take out is running and, and outpacing you. And so you catch up with them, slow them down by throwing the tomahawk. But in most of those contexts, it's a war party that is armed with multiple weapons. So you're throwing your tomahawk at your opponent, but you have a backup weapon or multiple backup weapons, maybe another tomahawk or a war club, or usually a knife, a big knife. So, you know, in most of these contexts, you could throw your, you aren't throwing your only weapon when you're throwing a tomahawk. But in this case, Van Campen had stolen this tomahawk. It was the only weapon he had on hand. If he threw it, he was losing it. So he held off on doing it. Not only that, but just because he's good at throwing tomahawks with tomahawks he owns, he's now grabbed a tomahawk like this that he's never owned, never practiced with. Spontoon tomahawks of this size really aren't that good at throwing. A really long handle gets in the way of blade impact. And you also don't have a rear-facing spike to plunge in. So when you look at, pardon my noise here, tomahawks that are really good at you know, having a high probability of sticking into target. This is our Stingray Tomahawk that was sort of inspired by um, a style of Tomahawks used by Iroquois. Um, they often featured a rear straight spike, a double flared chopping blade, and a short handle. And some of them even had pointed handles with like an iron cone on them. So as you're revolving in flight and the spin in flight, you have a high probability of hurting the opponent. Um, but with a really long handle and only a single projecting wounding uh, feature, your probability of you know, sticking an opponent and incapacitating them goes way, way down. So he wisely held off on the throw. Um, now, going back to the account, Pike, the stout Yankee, he was supposed to be killing two warriors with his tomahawk, but he totally clammed up failed to contribute to their rescue. And so their initial plan, um, you know, was three men with two stolen tomahawks and three rifles against 10 warriors. And since Pence was a coward, it went down to two men against 10 warriors, and Pike could only get one out of the three rifles to work, the last one he tried. And yet, against all odds, they were successful. So back to the account, uh, John Mohawk, the lone survivor of the war party, has fled. Um, so Van Campen is returning. On returning to his comrades, he found Pike on his knees begging for his life and Pence, the Dutchman, standing over him with a loaded rifle ready to fire. Pence answered Van Campen's inquiry into his conduct by saying, The damn Yankees beanies a coward and I must kill him. So this is a... Uh, I guess 19th century stereotype of a Dutchman's English. 
So with difficulty, Van Campen prevailed upon the Dutchman to spare the frightened and dastardly pike. They then scalped their victims and taking their, ri their rifles set forth with the two boys on their return home, which they reached in safety. Among the scalps which were strung to the belt of one of the warriors were those of Van Campen's father and brother who were slain uh, days before. Uh, so that is quite the story. It touches on several of the realities of warfare on the American frontier, um, things that we today would consider war crimes, but were the norm in the style of fighting and warfare on the frontier. It was really terribly brutal. Um, but speaking of early America, we are getting close to July 4th. And we have a big announcement. Wingard Wearables will be doing a sale um, starting today, going through 4th of July. Uh, the link to our shop is below. We're doing 10% off on all our spike tools and the Thumper Wear Club. And we're doing 20% off on all our available Tomahawks. Now, we have Empress Tomahawks of all sizes and uh, configurations. We've got Stingray Tomahawks. We have quills in all sizes and colors. We've got dick picks and micro dick picks. However, we are out of dick pick magnums and back rippers. Um, but definitely check it out. Lowest prices ever. And we've got these tasteful t-shirts, which are just fantastic. So you should check them out, support our channel, support our business. Now, we haven't done sales before. And we may not do sales again. This is uh, the only reason we're doing this is out of uh, business necessity. Uh, Wingard Wearables has some unexpected, very expensive custom tooling that we have to procure to both maintain current product lines and invest in future product lines. And we're not going to go out and get a loan and that sort of thing. It's, it's a revenue in and investment in business out. Um, so really, if you're interested in getting yourself a Wingard Wearables, a Stingray Tomahawk, an Empress Tomahawk, fantastic t-shirt, quills, dick pics, check it out. Now's the time. And remember, you are one of 12 special people who have stayed to watch through this video to the end. Share it so that 13 people will have watched it. And remember to be edgy.